Horus and Jensen, this is UX, and this is a new war with all generals, carnage on the western front, the great war week 4, but the channel the great war. I'm loving this series so far, we reacted to I guess you know a few videos from this channel already, the prelude and the you know three first three episodes of it, this is the fourth one. There are way too many episodes in this war which is kind of surprising to me because I don't know how can you make so many uh, you know episodes about just one war but that shows you that how in depth this channel goes. So yeah, in the early days of World War I, warfare is still based on ideas and ideals of 19th century generals. The technological progress during industrialization classes with obsolete war tactics. Plan 17. Tens of thousands of soldiers lose their lives in carnage at the Western Front. The French army marches into battle in bright uniforms or guardias. Oh, that's just after. Where the German army awaits them with machine guns. Artillery already showing how brutal and effective it's going to be during the rest of World War One. Okay, uh, what I don't get is, right, um, that it, Germany is the invading party, right? Germany is trying to invade France. So why were French and British soldiers were walking into no man's land where Germans in their barracks basically were shooting them down with machine guns? Isn't that supposed to be the other way around? So Germans are the one who's trying to invade. I get it in, in one instance, right, in Verdun. Basically, they had to, you know, relieve the pressure, right? So the French city doesn't fall. But that's just one instance, not the entire trench warfare. From the start, this has been the case. The British and French soldiers walk into no man's land just to get mowed down by the German machine guns. That should be other way around, shouldn't it? Because Germany is the one who's trying to invade. France is the defensive position. I don't know. So yeah, and yeah, about the French, uh, you know, bright uniforms, they still, you know, walk there like it's like Napoleonic War or, you know, wars like that, where, you know, it's just sabers and things, right? I mean, yeah, people are long guns, but, you know, we can still, I guess, they, there's no way they're going to snipe us down from the long distance and, you know, have something like machine guns. So they just walked around with, you know, bright uniform thinking, you know, we are representing our country with this, you know, bright colors, not knowing the modern warfare now. Basically, you have to blend in with the terrain, with, you know, somewhat of a camouflage uh, type of uniforms, you know, dull, dull green and, you know, beige type of colors. So, yeah, that's always this one. Many of the generals of World War I were almost completely out of touch with the lethal technology of the 20th century. In August 1914, this became very apparent. It remained a problem throughout the war, though, and led to the catastrophic loss of millions of young men's lives. Damn this intro. My name is Yeah, so this is why I say yeah, I know World War II was way too much deadlier than World War One, but World War One had that, you know, walking into new age surprise element to it, right? Because it's a new technologies, right? British even introduced tank and things like that. So everything's new, chemical attacks and things like that, right? You can't wear bright uniforms. It's a new age of, you know, basically literally next uh, you know level of warfare. Because yes, warfare has been improving every war, but in World War One it was a big jump considering the past. And after that, in World War Two it improved. Even today, it's improved immensely, but not at that level of scale, right? In World War One it jumped like it's the next modern age warfare now. So its surprise element basically was really effed up. That's why people didn't even realize that there's there's something like you know shell shock, PTSD could exist. They didn't know that at the point, but, you know, mortars and things like that, when people were in trenches and constantly for hours and hours getting bombarded by mortars, that goes, you know, that sold the ball like, holy shit, warfare is going to be even more brutal now. Cindy Nidel, welcome to the Great War. At the beginning of the week, the Austrians were slowly invading Serbia. The Germans were nearing Warsaw and besieging the fortresses of Belgium. The French had mounted their first offensives before retreating, and the English were transporting over 100,000 troops to mainland Europe. What we'll see is that when modern artillery, machine guns, and trains that could quickly move millions of troops around the continent met field tactics from a century earlier, this week would spiral into some of the bloodiest carnage of the entire war. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, seeing that British send over 100,000, because that is a big number, right? But during the World War II in the Eastern Front, as I was just reacting to the Operation Barbosa, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, just POWs. I mean, compared to that, this, I mean, that World War II's Eastern Front was ridiculous. 100,000 are supposed to be a lot, right? With this 100,000 soldiers. But in World War II, basically, Germans were taking POWs more than that number every time. 
The French had a battle plan, Plan 17, which very basically involved a defensive concentration of forces along the border with Germany, with counter strikes into Germany. Oh, no, one thing I don't get it. Okay, no, no, I get it. All right, but still, I, you know, the Germany thought go through Belgium, but why not Switzerland? I get it, it's mountainous, but still, Switzerland has been lucky, right? They're like, oh, we're gonna be neutral in World War One, World War Two, and they got lucky. Uh, obviously, it's strategic, right? Germans are not going to try to go through Switzerland. It's mountainous area. It's after, but still. Or possibly Belgium. The French army still thought it was the 1800s, and they went to war in brightly colored <laughs> uniforms with officers waving sabers in the front, mounted on chargers and marching bands, playing music, and the stand. The guy with the sabers like, if somebody shoots at me, I'm going to do the lightsaber thing and deflect it. Third <laughs> form of attack was masses of men advancing the way they had for centuries in the open. Colonel Serret, the French pre-war military attaché to Berlin, had repeatedly told France of the benefits of drab uniforms to help defend against modern artillery now that war could be conducted at a distance. But he was ignored. His words proved prophetic on August 20th, though, as the French army, in their bright colors, were slaughtered at Moorhangen, where the German army had a hilltop base, which had an unobstructed view for miles and miles. And the French, over 40,000 strong in their beautiful, blue and red uniforms marched straight across open fields towards it and the Germans just mowed down the French army column killing thousands upon thousands and take oh taking 20,000 prisoners the French were forced to retreat all the way back into France damn imagine Germans at the time of the hill basically just from the long distance seeing French army coming just thinking oh this is going to be easy we'll just use our artillery and just mow them down while well, French not knowing the Germans can see them at the distance, just thinking, oh, this is going to be a battle, and just got mowed down. That's just half up, man. 25 kilometers within their own borders. The next day, the French mounted another offensive in the forest of the Ardennes, and French commander-in-chief Joseph Joffre, who during these early days of the war often seemed like dictator of France, he had it all figured out. Joffre, wildly popular in France and later known as Papa Joffre, had at this point never commanded an army before, nor ever worked with a general army staff. Now, he had seen how strong the German left was the day before, and he knew how strong the right was in Belgium, so he figured the center was weak. He figured wrong. On the 22nd, the French attacked at Virton, just inside Belgium, in a heavy fog. And when the fog suddenly cleared, the French found themselves completely exposed to German hilltop gunners. And before you even try to guess what happened next, here's a little piece of information. French field regulations stated at the time that an assault could move 50 meters in 20 seconds before an enemy would have time to reload. These regulations totally omitted the existence oh of my God. machine guns. Verton was a catastrophe, and the French panicked and broke. Oh my God. Can machine gun be any more terrifying just because of its history? Holy shit, entire French tactics were wrong because of it. Because they didn't take machine guns into account. And yeah, the guy who was leading never commanded an army, and who knew he, he was going to be wrong about the forts and where is the weakness lies. God damn. So, you know, a guy who never commanded an army is now in the command of an army, right? He's making decision which he has no experience of. He's thinking there are weak points where there are none. Uh, French tactics say, okay, a guy will move this much and this, this is the time it's going to take for our enemy to reload. Eh, I don't think so. There are belt-fed machine guns there. Holy shit. At Bellefontaine, the French lost a third of their forces. At Rossignol, it was worse, as the French forces were trapped on a narrow road by German troops who were already well deployed among the trees, and the French were, again, just mowed down. And even the main French army further west was forced to retreat from Charleroi to avoid being entirely surrounded. On one... Okay, this is a stupid thing to say, but it's more like alternate history type of thing. But what if Napoleon was alive around this time and he was in charge of the army of French? Would he have, see, would he have seen this coming? Machine guns and things. So would he have been so oblivious because of the probably you couldn't keep up with the new technology? I don't know. Single day, August 22nd, 1914, the French lost 27,000 killed, as well as those wounded, missing, and captured. This was the single greatest loss one nation would have in one single day during World War I. In fact, by the end of August, 
France had lost 75,000 soldiers oh, killed God, in don't the war the real and another 200,000 wounded or prisoners. Now, France never fully recovered from this, but it's remarkable that she even recovered at all and was able to continue to fight. Now, the German army's problem wasn't so much one of being out of time as it was being out of touch. It was a belief that if an officer had been properly trained, then he would just know what to do in battle and could act independently of his orders. This independence would come back to haunt the Germans, and we saw it in play big style this week as the Germans launched their first major offensive on the Eastern Front. The German high. I think that independent thing comes from the Napoleonic times, right? With the marshals around Napoleon basically gave somewhat of a freedom to his marshals. But yeah, at this kind of scale, when you have modern technology, you basically have to have a large scale tactics rather than just rely on that. Man, mainly Army Chief of Staff von Moltke had given orders to the army in the east that they were not to make any attacks at all on the Russians until France had been defeated in the west. But the German general Francois in the field, seeing an opportunity, had disregarded these orders and attacked on August 17th, inflicting thousands of casualties and taking 3,000 Russian prisoners. The ironically named Francois was actually born in Luxembourg, but his father had been a Prussian general, and Francois was loath to give up any Prussian territory, being famously quoted as saying, General Francois will withdraw when he has defeated the Russians. Francois believed that even though the See, Russians... See, that's right, that is some bullshit, right? Your personal agenda should not overcome your duties at that point, right? This is what, what is a downfall of any, you know, battle or even, you know, a downfall of an army, basically. When your generals are acting out of their own interest because his father was a general in Prussia so that he don't want to give up Prussian land. That's not how war works, man. Put your personal feelings aside had the numbers, the German advantage in weapons and equipment meant that they should attack the Russians now. And he convinced his superior, von Prittwitz, to also go against orders. And on August 20th, the Germans attacked at the Battle of Gumbinen. The German attack against the Russians proved to be a failure, and Francois and the Germans were forced to retreat, thousands of them killed by the Russian guns, leaving some 6,000 German prisoners in Russian hands. Now, Moltke and Pritwitz panicked a bit after this defeat and worried that Berlin might even be threatened by the Russian army. So Pritwitz retreated more than 150 kilometers, leaving East Prussia entirely to the Russians, and Moltke transferred several divisions from the French front over to the Russian front. However, if we look back over at the French front, the German army there was, as we've talked about before, implementing the Schlieffen Plan, by which they would sweep down through Belgium and northern France, bypassing the heavily defended Franco-German border, and ideally defeat the French within six weeks, so the whole German army could then turn its attention towards Russia. So Moltke taking troops away from France to use against Russia might not have been his best idea. But the Schlieffen Plan seemed to be going well. On August 20th, German troops entered Brussels, the first European capital occupied by a foreign army since Paris in 1870. But to really see generals being both stuck in the past and acting independently of orders, we have to turn our attention to the Balkans. By the middle of August, the Austrian army was firmly established on the eastern shore of the Drina River and began advancing into Serbia. Now, the Austrians soon learned the hard way that the Serbian army knew its business. And the Austrian army was hopelessly out of date. See, the Serbs used things like hand grenades, which scared the crap out of the Austrians who had never seen them before. <laughs> Austrian general Oskar Potiorek had no interest in things like artillery ballistics and modern mountain guns. What? So Serbia was advanced at the time, but Austria was not. And here I was thinking Serbia is the little guy which Austria and Germany is going to pounce on. I mean, they will do that because numbers will, you know, will be way too many. But holy shit, at the start, Serbia had hand grenade and Austria like, okay, what is this? It's a, so imagine some Serbs basically throw a hand grenade and everybody's like, okay, what is this? There's a rocket, boom. <laughs> Damn. And to him, infantry artillery coordination didn't exist. Potiorek had actually been in the car with Franz Ferdinand the day the Archduke was assassinated, and it was he who had botched security that day. And like uh. many of the other military leaders at this point in the war, he was a career officer who had never seen a day of battle. On August 15th, the Austrian army assaulted Mount Kerr, a defended plateau about 30 kilometers east of the Drina. Now, it was tough climbing for the Austrians, so they had to leave their artillery behind. In the evening, in heavy rain, they reached the plateau. 
At 1 a.m., the Serbian troops closed in, opening fire on the sleeping and disorganized Austrians. And in just Ooh. the time it took for the Austrian army to rally, most of its officers were killed. Yeah. Hand-to-hand -hand combat lasted till the dawn. And with the dawn came Serbian reinforcements and artillery, and they forced the Austrian army to withdraw. On the 20th of August, the survivors of Mount Kerr retreated all the way back to Bosnia, having suffered nearly 28,000 casualties in the battle and its aftermath. By the evening of August 24th, no Austrians remained in Serbia except four and a half thousand prisoners of war. All right, you got to give it to Serbians, right? Austria basically used Archduke, you know, Franz Ferdinand's death as an excuse to pounce on Serbia because they thought it's a little guy, we'll just take it like that, right? And we use the assassination as an excuse so people don't basically try to come after us or something like that. And yes, Serbia is the one who's kicking that ass. That's something. So at the end of the week, Germany was advancing in the west and retreating in the east. But what we see most of all is a generation of Frenchmen being killed and maimed because their high command was in a Napoleonic fantasy. And the great Austro-Hungarian Empire, with its incompetent officers, outdated equipment, and outdated ideas, had been humiliated by a tiny Balkan nation. Over the next four years, warfare would basically move from 1870 to 1940. Death would come to soldiers in never before imagined ways. From the skies, on the sea, under the seas, above the ground, on the ground, and even below the oh, ground. Oh, come on, Dad. The mindsets of the men leading these soldiers to their deaths changed only slowly, though. And before they caught up with modern tactics and technology, 10 million young men would die. We'll see you next week. Click subscribe to get each and every episode. And if you want to know how all this could have happened... Damn, I'm trying to, you know... Uh trying to get past the point but this is just effed up right every time he saws that real you know real footage of dead boys lying around everybody just shooting because they have to shoot they can't just you know put their focus on a guy who's dead besides them damn world was a fucked up you know i know you know this is like you know austria just used an excuse to take over serbia and serbia kicking their ass they should be like oh yeah serbia kicked their ass but i can't have that feeling knowing in the end serbia austria and everybody just died left and right it was just people in power who wanted to have this thing, while all the common people, soldiers who died, wanted nothing of it. That's why there's such thing as Christmas truce. Because even Germans, French, and British are like, okay, enough of this shit. At least let's chill on the Christmas. And everybody just, you know, did the toast and, you know, whatever. So, you know, in World War II, you can see Nazis are bad elements. So, when someone Nazis dies, you're like, yeah, you know, yeah, but, you know, allies won or something like that. But in World War I, you can't think from any side because all the common soldiers that die, whether it's Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, France, or Britain. <sighs> Damn. All right, people, there was a, a new war with old generals. Carnage on the Western Front by the channel The Great War. If you like my Rick's and like and subscribe, check out the Rick's and there's a link in the description. Check out the cars, what place I got in cards, and yeah, I'll see you next time.